G'day guys and welcome. You're listening to The Unaffected. Coming up on today's episode, we speak with Taylor and Kaylee McEwen, Olympic swimmers who had lost their father after a two-year battle with brain cancer. Keep listening to gain some insight into the resilience the girls have shown in the years since they lost their dad Sholto to brain cancer. We hear some of their fondest memories of the larrikin that Sholto was, and we hear the girls' take on what their dad would have made of the famous post-gold race interview slip-up. G'day guys, Jack from The Unaffected, the podcast where we bring you the stories about people's experience being affected by a loved one's disability, illness or condition. With me as always is Nick and today we are brought to you by Australia's best boutique care agency, Care Match Australia. Make sure to check out their socials on Facebook and Instagram for all your caring needs. As you can probably tell guys, I'm calling in via phone today because I'm not feeling the best, so in light of COVID, I thought it would be best to play it safe and keep my distance, but it's not all bad because I think my de- my voice is a little bit deeper and brings me a little bit closer to Nick's Barry White voice. Look, you can keep hoping, but uh, <laughs> while, while Jack's home having a sort we're, um we're here and with me today, I guess, uh, Taylor and Kaylee McEwen, Olympics medalists in the pool. Taylor and Kaylee have had their struggles as their father, Sholto, passed away from brain cancer in August last year, two years post-diagnosis. The girls have been good enough to come in and have a chat to us today about how they've made it through the tough times as a family and the impact it's had on them. Taylor and Kaylee, thanks for coming in and have a chat with us. Really appreciate it. Um, All right, let's start. Take us back and tell us what your family life looked like. Oh, from from as early as I can remember. As early as you remember, the way where you grew up, what what your family was like. I had a sweet six years of my life as an only child. (laughs) And, and I popped out. And then this thing <laughs> popped out. And my life has changed ever since Kaylee decided to come along. Downhill since then or uphill? What do you reckon? Oh, there's definitely been ups and downs. Uh, yeah, it was different adapting to having another little human running around the house. And I wasn't the center of attention anymore. Um, but I think as we've gotten older, we've definitely grown closer. Um, from when she was born, basically up until... I moved out. We were always fighting on and off. So we've had quite an interesting childhood together, I would say. Always, always competitive with everything. Mm. I mean, the six year age gap doesn't really help, but (laughs) yeah, yeah, you can only, you can only imagine what it would have been like growing up with one another, but we always had the best childhoods. Like our parents gave us everything that they could, like from camping on every school holidays to just Mm. like, you know, motorbikes to the backyard and yeah, yeah. I'd say we had a really good childhood and brought up the best way we really could yeah, we experienced a lot. Um, like we traveled a lot as a family and we traveled a lot with our close family friendship groups. So we grew up and we always had other kids around. And I think as a kid, all you can ask for is like a fun childhood where you're really adventurous. And Kaylee and I got a lot of that, um, as well as having really supportive parents who would drive us to and from training all the time and all of the weekend swimming carnivals. So I, I reckon we were very lucky. Probably competing with each other would be a reason why you ended up achieving so highly in your in your sport. I yeah, yeah. I think it also comes from our dad. I remember this one afternoon. I came home from school. I was like, I really want to get good at high jump. So he set up like tent poles and like a rope, and he was like, oh trying to compete God. against me. I was like, Dad, come on. He did that like, for me as well. <laughs> yeah, I was like, you're 40 years old, and I'm like 10. I was like, come on. <laughs> when we like made um, district carnivals to represent our school, I randomly made it for high jump one year and like cross country. So dad would go on jogs with me around the block and then also did the same as Kaylee, like set up this rad high jump in the backyard for us to play on. That's awesome. Just always encouraging, which was fantastic. That's good. How did um, you guys get into swimming and what role did your your dad play in your swimming over the years? Was he similarly supportive like he was with the other athletic endeavours? I'd say that Mumsy was kind of the one who would drive us around a lot more. Um, I mean, it kind of alternated. I mean, Taylor had a bit more to do with dad when she was growing up, whether when I was getting older, it was more so mum driving me everywhere. So it kind of got a bit different. Yeah. I don't know. I guess it just changed because of the jobs that our parents had at the time and where they were. So 
for me, um, mum would do the before school runs to training and dad would do the after school runs to training. And then when Kaylee kind of came on the scene, mum was around a lot more to be able to do that stuff. Um, so both of our parents were really good at being supportive in whatever we wanted to do. I mean, I remember going to watch Kaylee do dance lessons when she was a toddler and play and, <laughs> and play like toddler basketball and, and stuff like that. So whatever we wanted to try, they were always willing to let us have a go. Yeah. Out of the sports that you've played, how did swimming become the one that you uh, chose to pursue or is it just a matter of that what you were best at? Yeah, well, for me personally, um, I played tennis and softball and I played softball quite competitively up until about the age of 13. And around that time, I was trying to qualify for age group nationals and swimming as well. And I ended up qualifying one year, only in one event, the 100 meter breaststroke. And our family, like we packed up the car, Kaylee included, we drove all the way down to Sydney from the Sunshine Coast. We got there and I didn't swim that great. And that's when my coach kind of pulled me aside as a 14 year old. And he said, look, Taylor, if this is something you want to do and you want to get better at, you're actually going to have to dedicate more to training. And I kind of thought, okay, well, you know what? I'll quit playing softball. Let's just go everything into swimming. And then I did that. And the following year, I came back as a 15 year old and I won the 100 breaststroke, won the 200 breaststroke and got bronze in the 200 medley. So for me, that was kind of like the light bulb moment where I was like, holy shit, I can train really hard and I can race really well. Like, let's do this swimming thing. And actually make something of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think having Kaylee along for that journey to be able to see the things that I was doing and what swimming could be, I I guess she kind of just naturally fell into it. And she's always been really competitive. I remember watching Kaylee do carnivals. She would do a 25 meter breaststroke race. And on every breath, she would look left and right to see where her competition was <laughs> as she was swimming. So um, it's it's kind of been something that I think or in terms of competitiveness, that's naturally been within our family as a whole. Um, and I guess swimming was just the one that we enjoyed the most. Yeah, and, I think yeah. um, myself personally, as soon as Taylor moved out of home, my parents were like, oh, we can either follow Taylor down to Brisbane or move to Sunshine Coast. And I was like, mm don't really like Brisbane. So um, we moved to Sunny Coast and I started training up there and I met a lot of my now close friends um, from Pelican Waters there. And then the coach, John Wallace, just said to me, he's like, you're really talented. I think you should just stick to swimming and see where it takes you. So that was at age 12. And from there on, I kind of just built up to where I am now. Yeah, right. So for those that weren't lucky enough to meet him, tell us about Shelto. What was he like? Oh, gosh. I mean, I only had 19 years, which is a little bit unfortunate. But from my background, he was always there, even though he worked in the mines when I was kind of like around 12 to, you know, 18. Didn't get to see him that much. But anytime he was home, he was always so hands on and willing to do absolutely anything to spend time with either myself or Taylor. And like we touched on before, like he was building go karts for us when we were kids, like did Building cubby anything, houses, yeah. like literally anything that we even had the slightest idea of. He was like, yeah, let me go build it. It was like, <laughs> we got this new house that the two-story house in Caboolture, oh, yeah. it had a pool. And we were like, the pool wasn't enough. We wanted a water slide. So dad got on Facebook and like found this water slide and went and we drove and we picked it up and then he built the ladder and like the system which pushes the water down the slide. Oh, really? So just just awesome at doing whatever he could to make both of us girls happy. Um, I guess he is a larrikin, like he loved his beer. Very he witty. loved his okay. footy, um, always the jokes are like super onto it. And then just like loved your classic pub rock music bands like the Angels yeah. and the Radiators. Put it this way, like just such a legend. He was the parent that you would go to if you wanted anything. Oh, <laughs> like, right. It's like, yeah. hey, Dad, can I have some ice cream? Yeah, okay. Just don't, don't, just don't, don't tell, tell your mother. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was the yes man yeah. of the family, okay. which was awesome. Yeah. You knew yeah. you were in trouble when you'd go to dad first and he'd be like, oh, go to your mother. And you're like, yeah. oh, no, that's, yeah. a, that's a no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds just a real, like a true Aussie sort of yeah. bloke. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah, just classic uh, Australian, I guess. Do he, anything He was anybody. born in England and came over at age six. And I think it's amazing how quickly he picked up the Australian lifestyle and, yeah, okay. you know, supported the Brisbane Broncos, just like right into everything that Aussies were into. And then even at the Olympics and at the world championships that he watched Kaylee compete in, like would dress up in the green and gold and face paint and wigs and everything. So it was just right into it. Like awesome. Bit wild. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did he have a sporting background himself? He sounds like he was more than supportive of, uh, of both of your um, 
athletic endeavours. Let me tell you, the amount of times he tried to get me into soccer is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. School, he's like are, you, are you signing up to soccer? I'm like, no, Dad, I don't like it. He's like, oh, come on, you can be really good at it. I, you know, I used to do it as a kid. I was like, mm, no, thanks. <laughs> so, yeah, he played soccer growing up and I think he also played a bit of cricket, cricket, um, softball. Yeah, I think did softball with mum when they first met (laughs) and social netball. So yeah. 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 He was really competitive as well. Like even if we would race him in the backyard and something, he wouldn't let the kids win just to make the kids happy. It was like always dad had to win. And I remember a couple of times mum getting up him like, Stop being so hard on the girls and just let them win for once because just didn't it, care it works, just so competitive it? yeah it, it works so. I, can, yeah. I can totally relate to that i got a four-year-old daughter and i don't let her win at anything yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you got to teach him to be able to lose from a young age it's a good skill exactly. it's the things now he hasn't learned yet. They, like don't keep score and stuff in sport these days and oh you're think. kidding yeah i'm no. pretty sure because they, they can't learn they to can't lose handle and, the losing i know it's a bit yeah, precious it is a little bit <laughs> yeah uh Tell us about your, your dad's diagnosis. Were there early symptoms that made him go and get some um, tests and what tests did yeah. he go through to get that diagnosis? So I guess, like I said previous, Taylor moved out of the home when she was 17 and dad always had this growth in the back of his brain. It's It wasn't related to the cancer at all, but it was just like a uh, cyst, like yeah. a small yeah. cyst. And, you know, he would come home from fly in, fly out and he was like, oh, like I think the turbulence and you no, know, sorry, not turbulence, altitude is really getting to me. And mom and I were like, come on, go, go get like a head scan and an MRI. So he went to the doctors and they put it down to, you know, all the altitude and they gave him altitude medication and I think it's altitude medication. I don't really know, but um, but we'll stick with that. Um, And I just remember this. I I feel horrible because I came home from training and I was like, dad, where's my dinner? Like, come on, I'm starving. All I wanted was spaghetti bolognese and garlic bread. And you're you're laying on the bed and he's like, I'm not feeling well, Kaylee. And I was like, oh, all right. Like, it's very rare that I'd ever see my dad like sit on the bed and not want to help. And I was like, this isn't good. So the next, I think that was on a uh, Tuesday and the Wednesday he went in for a head scan, um, got the results and they said, you know, you've got a stage four um, brain tumor. Um, these are your options. He's like, I think it was four months um, to live without surgery or, you know, it's kind of like a bit of give and take two years with surgery. So mum and dad kind of buckled down and tried to find the best surgeon as quick as possible. And he was having surgery that Friday. Shit. In yeah. Brisbane. Quick turnaround. Yeah. Yeah. After also contemplating going to Sydney as well. Yeah. So there was a lot of rushing around, a lot of organisation, and then they finally settled on a surgeon in Brisbane, which was awesome. But I visited the weekend prior from the Gold Coast, and I remember pulling into the driveway, and Dad had come out of the bedroom to come and see me. And he came out, and he, like, bent over and put his hands on his knees, and his face was white. And I was like, what's wrong with you? You look like shit. He was like, yeah, I've got it, the worst headache. And I was like, oh, I'll go take some Panadol and go back to bed. Like, don't worry about saying hello to me or whatever. I don't care. Went back to bed. And then, yeah, it was like later that week um, that we found out that he had been diagnosed. So like as shitty as it is, it was so fortunate that he did have a job where it's a fly and fly out because I don't think without, you know, him having those altitude problems or what they so thought was the altitude problems, he wouldn't have got it checked. Yeah. Yeah. Was That's it, why it's so important. Like anytime someone says to me, like, oh, I've been having these symptoms of something for a period of time now, I'm like, please properly go and get checked. Just get because it checked, yeah. the amount of guys out there who might think like, oh, I've had a headache for like a week now, it's just a bad migraine. You just never know. And it's always better to be safe than sorry. It could save years of your life or if not your entire life. So that's why I think that out of everything, that's a really important message to push forward is that always get checked no matter what your symptoms are. If you suspect something, you're probably right. So just go and get it done. And even if it's, you know, dad the first time was told it was altitude and then went back for a second opinion and turns out that wasn't the case at all. So yeah. if, you, if you really think that there is a problem, keep chasing until you find the answers. Yeah, yeah definitely. Let's say early diagnosis can be yeah, the best absolutely. thing in cases. Yeah. Was there ever a chance with the surgery of other complications or was that always sort of... There was. Um, he'd had a history with blood clotting in the past. So we knew that when he had surgery, there was going to be issues with having potential of, of blood clots to you know block up the lungs and whatever. And it did happen after the first surgery. He had clots in his legs, um, which he had to go on like blood thing medication for. But, you know, after like a couple of hours in hospital, that was kind of all okay. 
Um, and I guess with any kind of surgery to do with anything in the brain, there's always the risk that something's going to go wrong. It's such a fragile area of, of the body. And so that's why we wanted to make sure that we had had a really experienced surgeon who, um, he was going to be in good hands and dad was super nervous going in. The whole family was there. It was like quite a traumatic time, but we knew that he was, had the best chance with this surgeon. So we really put all of our trust into him and just let things happen. Yeah. And was that why you were uh, looking into going to Sydney? It was just so you had as much confidence as you could in the surgeon? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Just and as just, many you know, opinions as possible, really. Yeah, cover all bases. Yeah. How did your parents break the news to you two that it was? Well, we were coming back then. Kaylee didn't have her license. So we would train together and then we would come back to my place on the Sunshine Coast. And then from there, mum and dad, either of the parents would come and pick Kaylee up to take her back to the house in Dickie Beach. And it was around midday. I got a text from mum and mum's like, oh, like not good news. Dad's been diagnosed with a grade four glioblastoma. No, no, no. That's not how it happened. <laughs> yes, it is. No, it is. And maybe mum was different. Right? Yours was different. And then um, mum was like, um, don't say anything to Kaylee. Like when we go to pick her up, we'll let her know. So I was like, oh shit. Like, and I'm doing all this Googling before training, trying to work out what all of this doctor's lingo means. I had no idea. And then I worked it out and I was like so upset at training. And I was like telling our coach, Chris Mooney, I was like, look, this has happened. Don't tell Kaylee until mum and dad have told her at home. So that whole afternoon at training, I had to pretend like nothing was wrong. And then we're driving back to our place, my, sorry, my place on the sunny coast. And then mum and dad came over, pretty much sat down, Kaylee and I, and we're like, look, this is what's happened. This is what we're doing moving forward and broke the news that way. Yeah. Like I had no idea about that. That's the first time oh, I've really? heard. Yeah. yeah. Um, hence why I was like, that's not how it went. <laughs> yeah. But like Taylor said, um, a text from mum being like, oh, dad and I need to tell you something. I was like, oh, okay, like maybe a divorce. I was like, maybe we're moving <laughs> houses again. But I like no idea that that, that was going to be the news. And I just remember sitting on the couch being like, I was like, cancer? I was like, are you serious? Like no cancer is good cancer. So I just remember sitting there absolutely bawling my eyes. I was like, dad, are you going to die? And I felt horrible saying that to him because imagine like what was going through his head at that point. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, just some of the things. I'm like, I wish I'd never said that. Yeah, couldn't. Yeah, but you don't really know how you're going to react in the time. Like, no. given that news is so shocking, you just yeah. you just never know yeah. how you're going to take it. To deep and how did yeah? How did your dad handle the the diagnosis? Well, I think he suffered a lot behind closed doors, as in like with my mother, Sharon. Um, but to both Taylor and I, he was always so strong and confident. He, like I said, when he came home from the mines, he would sit there have a beer every night, like down as many carbs as possible and he just did as much research as possible and he um i think it's called a keto diet so oh, yeah. as minimum like carbs or sugars so cut beers out completely and for him to do that was a big deal so we knew that he meant business and he really wanted to beat this cancer and i think that just goes to show the determination and kind of courage that he's instilled in us and that just goes to show him as a person as well yeah think from what you said about what he was like with the family he would have i mean that sort of thing in yourself you'd want to do it for yourself and i'm sure extra motivation for you girls and yeah for your mum to give it every chance you can to beat it mm, yeah i just remember coming over and like i'd never seen dad read books before and then all of a sudden there's these piles of like books on cancer and medication and the brain and everything and he really like outside of the traditional treatments of chemo and radiation he, like you name it, he was doing it. He was phoning people from all walks of life around Australia trying to get advice. Um, and then once he found something that was working really well for him, he would share that information with other people who were going through brain cancer treatments as well. So not only was he doing this huge amount of research and listening to podcasts and that kind of thing to help himself, he was also then trying to help others and guide them in the right direction as well if they had any questions about any of the stuff he was doing outside of um, the chemo and radiation. When we say he was doing anything, like I remember he was taking dog worming tablets. Oh, really? <laughs> so, and it actually like... That I was think, a period of time where he there was a reduction in the tumour. And the doctors had no idea what was going on. They're like, whatever you're doing, stick to it. Um, but I think dad kind of just got too excited at that point and forgot to kind of keep the research going and was just sticking to the same methods. Cause I think 
um, I'm no professional, but the cancer cells get stronger and immune to what you, whatever you're putting in your body. So I know that there was fembenzanol and then there was another kind of chemical in the tablet that he had to alternate between the two and he just forgot. So, yeah, yeah I mean, there's things like that that you're just like the little slight bits of hope um, that aren't the typical treatments. Yeah, it got hectic, like the juicing, the lemon drink. He would always carry this drink bottle which was like water and lemon infused to just like just trying to always keep his systems really flushed and healthy and honestly at the end of the day I think his effort extended his life past that original diagnosis so we got two years and three or four months out of him and when I did the research myself it was like someone with a grade four is usually only a year to two years so to go beyond that two-year period was amazing. I suppose that would be comforting as well knowing that your dad kind of threw everything he had at it and left no stone unturned. Yeah. There's nothing worse than, you know, seeing people who feel sorry for themselves. And my dad was definitely not that kind of person. Um, I think if anything, he saw it as a more of a motivation to live his life that little bit better. Mm. Yeah, Yeah. I think so. I think he was kind of like, I need to be around as long as I can for my family. So he did everything that he could after that original diagnosis outside of nutritional treatments as well was it so common talking to the the parents we have that go through these hard times it really brings out that selfless role that parents have to play in these really difficult times they still have to maintain that um role as the rock of the family even like when it's them going (laughs) through it like you you said that you think that he probably um, had a lot more going on behind the closed doors but for the family put on the brave face to, yeah. I suppose, make the journey a little easier on you all. Yeah. Although, Absolutely. you know, dad was diagnosed, nothing changed in our lives. Like I carried on with my swimming as did Taylor. We did, yeah, everything in our lives was normal. And I remember dad saying to me, he was like, I know you want to come to the appointments and just hear about what's happening. But he's like, I don't want you to do that. I know that you want to be here to support me, but I know no matter what that you will be here. He's like, so just keep doing what you're doing, kiddo, and don't worry about me. And there's something else we've had with other guests as well that they say they're only as strong as the people around them and, you know, if the other people around them are being positive and, you know, keeping things going, it gives them more motivation. They want to be strong for the people around them. So I imagine as a family, if you, you know, you're getting on with things, you're supporting your dad, it's just giving him extra motivation and sort of at the same time as making most of the time and then it also, yeah, gives him motivation to keep going. Yeah, 100%. I think the more positive vibes that you're surrounded by, the better chance that you have of beating any type of cancer. And I also think keeping the routine the same makes it feel as though nothing's changed and that can be comforting in itself because you're not constantly sitting there reminded of the fact that you have a terminal illness. And if from the time you're diagnosed, everything's turned on its head, I feel like that can be really stressful and kind of not helpful at all. So we spent a lot of time together. Um, Shortly after dad was diagnosed, I changed swimming clubs and moved down here to the Gold Coast. And there was a lot of weekends where mum and dad would come down and stay over, which was really nice. And then like every second weekend, I was going up to the sunny coast. So we still spent a lot of time together, um, but it wasn't always that constant, awful reminder of what's actually happening in the background. Yeah. And did you say that your dad stayed working doing fly and fly out for a period of time after the diagnosis? Yeah, so as soon as he got clearance to be able to fly, he was back out to the mines. Um, I think like like I, we both said, he didn't want to change anything in his life and that's what he enjoyed doing, so why stop him from doing that? Yeah, he also got um, – he was working locally for a little while as well when flying wasn't such a good option. He was like, well, if I can't fly, I'm going to go work somewhere local. So he did find a nice little local job and was able to be stimulated and keep going as normal as possible through that. He's the kind of man, like just typical Aussie, like even on his weeks home from work, he was doing something around the house. Like you would never see him just sitting down doing nothing unless, you know, it was a nighttime and he was having a beer in his hand. So, yeah, to see him wanting to keep working was kind of like a reminder to Taylor and I that nothing's wrong. Keep doing what you need to do. Yeah. When it was described as um, terminal, did, did you ever give up hope of – of beating it or was it did you accept it or did he accept it as a family that's a really tough yeah, question no it's hard it's i guess when you're told that you have a grade four glioblastoma or something that's terminal you think like okay it's there eventually but it's not right now if you know what i mean and i always kept thinking okay well 
another two years time, another two years time, another two years time until like shit really did get real. And he was in and out of palliative care. And then that's kind of when it hit me being like, okay, this is going to end. Like this has to have an end soon. So I guess in, in the lead up, I was like, you know, you know, it's there, but you never know how close. So you just don't think about it. Like you said, when you want to, concentrate on the positive there's no point thinking thinking towards that yeah that end yeah. is it you just focus on the day-to-day yeah exactly. being it getting better yeah i remember yeah. when it did start to go downhill it was kind of during peak covid um i got a phone call from mum being like oh don't panic if you come home and there's you know ambulance at the front dad had a fall last night and he's going into the hospital um so he got taken to the hospital and because he had hit his head there was extra swelling there and they said we can't do anything for him anymore Um, we've got to stop the treatments and go to palliative care. And I just remember seeing in the room with the doctor, mum bawling her eyes out, Taylor pretty much on the eyes, like on the edge of bawling her eyes. And I just looked at the doctor and I knew everyone was sinking and I just said, how long? And the doctor kind of said, could be weeks, could be a month. So I remember hearing that news and I was like, right, right now my family is a priority. So the next morning I went to training, I told everybody what was going on. And just said, if I'm not here, my sister's not here. It's because we've got bigger problems to deal with. And I hope you guys can respect that. And they really did. They were the best supporters. And I think like we've touched on before, having that extra support team is is crucial in these kind of times. Mm. It was good because it, for me, it was a squad that I used to be a part of. And then I was kind of accepted back in to be able to train with them for the time that I was spending on the sunny coast for like the three months I was up there with dad. And it was like nothing had changed. They just kind of accepted me back as a family. And I think that goes to show how incredible the swimming community in Australia is. And I think um, the culture within Swimming Australia has come a long way to the point now where something like this can happen and people don't even blink an eyelid. You know, they're, they're there with flowers. They're coming to the funeral. They're messaging every day swimmers from across Australia because word gets out and everyone wants to check in. So having that embrace from people in the community as well made that journey for me personally so much easier. I imagine like training for the Olympics taken up, it's, it would be your world. It's all you're doing. It's what you, all your concentrations on. And like you said, when that stuff happened with your dad, and you said, you know, taking a step back and I'm not here, that's what it is. It would have been a massive perspective um, sort of change to go, you know, this is what's, in, this is what's important. Yeah. The Olympics is something so massive and it's what I'm training for that family is really just more important. Yeah. I, I guess to flip, that, flip of that as well, Dad had always wanted to see Taylor and I go to the Olympics and represent our country. Um, so that was – it became more of a motivation for me to be able to stand up at our trials and be like, my dad would love to see me go to the Olympics. And like the fire in my belly, I cannot explain. Like I just wanted to do that, not for myself, but for him. Um, Sorry, I'm getting quite emotional now. (laughs) Um, But yeah, it just, it's just unreal to know that when someone passes, it can really just light you up in a, a certain way. You can either go one way or the other. And I think I definitely chose the way to make it into a positive. And I think Taylor's the same. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely gave me kind of, I would say, like the motivation to realize like how good life is. And it made me really angry for a period of time where I would hear people complaining about like stupid minor things. And I'd be like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> like, yeah. You're not going to die tomorrow. You're not going to die on Thursday. You're not going to die on Saturday. Your life is good. You know, like shut up. And it just, the irritation I felt when people would do that, it was just so indescribable. And then while that's going on, the drive for me within was like, you know, how good is life? Like, let's go and do this. Let's do this. Let's experience what life is while we can, you know, because you never know when it's going to, when it's going to get taken away. Yeah, exactly. It's a a massive thing we've had. I reckon every guest we've had on here is the same thing. And we've had people following accidents and I've spoken about before my accident, same sort of thing Yeah, that you just focus on all these little things. And yeah, Jack's, we've spoken about it a lot and haven't we the bit, focus on little yeah. things like money or all these other little things that so are petty. so insignificant yeah. in the bigger scheme of things. And yeah. sometimes it takes a life changing accident or a death in the family, whatever it might be to, to make you realize that, but hopefully for the people listening to not let it get to that stage for them to take mm. it from other people yeah. and just, yeah, enjoy your life. Yeah. Honestly, it like, it's made me kind of come up with this little like motto or saying, and it's like, you know, if your life's not at imminent risk, it's not worth stressing about. 
And I just think if I'm going to wake up in two weeks time and I'm going to be alive and I'm breathing and I've got somewhere to live and I've got friends and family, then it's not worth really stressing about. And I think that's a really good way to kind of keep humble in life and um, live more relaxed. Yeah. Yeah. Perspective is such a massive thing. And it's just unfortunate for a lot of people that can sometimes take these tragic turn of events to make you appreciate how even just like having your health and a functioning body, how lucky you are to have that. I think, COVID especially, like, I know some people's lives have been affected, but still there's a lot of people in many parts of the world that would give anything to spend one day in in our country with the lives that we're living. So yeah, being, feeling lucky and remembering what we, you do have and being grateful for what you have is so important. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think being grateful for the things that you do have – and not stressing about the things that you don't have is really important to create a healthy lifestyle. Um, and I know since dad's passed, if I hear any of my friends complaining about work or having to get up early or anything small like that, I just kind of nudge them and be like, oi, it's not that bad. You know, you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. 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 Did you miss many days of training through, through the whole experience? Yeah, I guess when dad was in palliative care, we spent probably two weeks just in and out. Um, We kind of just, I used swimming as an outlet then to really try and relax myself and just take my mind away what from what was happening behind the scenes. Whether, you know, swimming's usually like my, you know, you go to the train hard then you go home to relax. It was the opposite. Go to the pool to relax and then go home to really help the family. So as much as it was a shitty time, swimming was my only way out. A bit of a release and therapeutic yeah. for you. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, all in all, I probably missed about two months of swimming. I spent a lot of time on the sunny coast and then once dad passed as well, stayed around for a bit longer to offer support and then mum was actually pushing me out. She's like, you need to go back to the Gold Coast now. <laughs> I was like, okay, fine, I'll see. <laughs> yeah, it is a very therapeutic thing, swimming. You can't talk to anyone and you just – with your own thoughts and yeah. yeah, it can yeah yeah help you a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Did you ever feel like the fact that there was a terminal diagnosis? I mean, you said you want to keep it pretty day to day and keep going, don't make things change. But do you ever think it lets you sort of grieve a little bit before the actual passing and help with that whole process? Yeah, I reckon our mum, and she says this as well, um, grieved for a long period of time before dad actually passed away. I think it's because you're kind of preempting what's going to happen and you start imagining what life is going to be like without that person. And I think, well, for example, one of my swimming friends' brother who was 18 years old passed away in a car accident two weeks ago. And it's kind of like one, one second he was at home and then the next second he was never coming back. And I think, oh my gosh, I felt so sorry for her. I was like, that is such a traumatic thing to all of a sudden have someone disappear like that. And whereas in our circumstance, we were given time to prepare. We, were, we knew that there was an end date and we really cherished, we were able to then cherish the time that we did have together. Um, and me personally, I made more of a point of making sure that the time we had together was doing something um, fun, like taking my parents to Tiplas on Stradbroke Island on the jet ski and them absolutely hating it, but me loving bumping them around <laughs> and, and just making these fun memories, which I knew were going to be lasting in my brain forever, even when dad passed away. When you, you know that, there's a, there's a, the time of a passing is coming. Is it in your mind to make sure that you don't leave things unsaid or just, is there always going to be things that you wish you had said while you had the opportunity? Uh, I, like to this day, I feel a lot of regret in the sense that as much as I wanted to be by, by dad's side, I really struggled to see him the way that he was. But I think if I were to go back and do it again, I would spend as much time as I could just to really be there to show my love and support. Not that I never did, but I definitely could have been there more than I was. Yeah, I don't know. It's a tricky one. Um, I like there's always going to be random things that pop up and you're like, oh, I wish I did that different. I wish I said that. But I try to remind myself that there's no point in thinking over the what ifs because 
then you can turn a good memory into a bad one really easily. Like, what if I just did this? Or what if I just, you know, I didn't do that and I went and spent time with my dad. But um, I think we did really well as a family to spend a lot of time together in the period leading up till. Um, and even when he was in and out of the palliative care, you know, we would kind of take turns like Kaylee might go in the morning and then go home in the afternoon and relax or go to training. And then I would go in the afternoon and we'd sit there and we'd listen to the radiators, we'd play chess, we'd play connect four and just do all this random stuff in the palliative care. And, um, I think looking back, we did quite a good job as a family to kind of leave nothing unturned. It was really sweet as well. Like obviously the ladies and men who work there, see a lot of families come in and out and this one lady she pulled me to the side and she was like I've never seen a family be here so much for somebody she's like it's awesome to see that people love each other like this and she was like the amount of friends that you've had to come and check in like obviously peak COVID so they're checking in all the time she's like it's insane yeah just the love and support that your family has he must be a great man they actually um, had to put a cap on how many people we were allowed in the room because of COVID and we kept breaking the limit <laughs> like by double. So at one point we had like six of us in the room and then like another 10 of us out in the courtyard. So <laughs> dad was so likable. He was so easy to get along with. And I think he touched a lot of people in his lifetime. And I think he made a lasting impression on everyone that he met and who could forget such an awkward name like Sholto. So, you know, (laughs) um, yeah, it it was awesome to see the turnout and, you know, in the end we were even allowed the dogs to come in, (laughs) which was awesome. (laughs) So I think the staff in the palliative care were a little overwhelmed at uh, how many people were in and out. Like we were quite rowdy and annoying at some points as well. (laughs) That's awesome. That's like (laughs) such a shit situation, obviously, but I guess, yeah, and take comfort in the fact knowing that those, even in those last days, he had so much support and he was yeah. so loved and yeah. you can carry that on, on yeah. the rest of your life. Yeah, knowing it, that. Was, it was so nice to see how many people wanted to be by his side and, you know, like dad's best mate flew up from Tasmania and was staying on a wheelie bed, all the couch that the palliative care would wheel out for him. So <laughs> <laughs> it was such a huge team effort and even dad's other friends who still had to work, they would finish work, come up to the sunny coast, spend the whole night and then drive back to Brisbane for work the next day. So um, just knowing the legacy that he's left behind was just so touching. Yeah. When the terrible day finally came, how did you both deal with it? I don't know you touched on the fact that you were able to grieve a little bit before and you knew it was coming, but when it did come, yeah, how did you deal with that? Um, I think it was, I think, 4.42 a.m. I got a phone call from my dad's best mate being like, oh, you need to come in. Um. And I like ran into Taylor and Lockie's room. I was like, get up, we need to go. And um, I know this is really illegal, but Lockie was doing what, 180 in this old Hilux down the highway. Oh and it, was, it was shaking and we're like, come on, Lockley. <laughs> it was like roadworks as well. So the road was so shit. And uh-huh. we, Randall, dad's best friend was like, yeah, you guys need to come in. And we had only just got back home like two hours prior. So we were back home at 2 a.m. Because the six hours Prior to that, it was kind of like you're on your last breaths kind of thing. And dad just kept playing tricks on us. We would think (laughs) like, oh, it was so, it was, we were actually laughing at one point because we're all in the room. It's this really tense situation and dad's breathing's really sporadic and you can hear the rattle in his chest, which is what they say people have at the end of their life. And for the first time in my life, I heard that. And as soon as I heard that, I, I knew it was coming to an end. So we're all in there and we're bracing and we're bracing and it just, it kept going on, it kept going on. And it was so stressful that my best friend, Kaylee, my partner and I actually left the room and we played a game of Twister (laughs) for about an hour and we had some hot chocolates and then we came back in and the rest of the family was still in there and they were like, we don't know how long this is going to go on for. You girls might want to go home and have a a quick nap and then come back tomorrow morning. But um, yeah, we got that phone call really early in the morning. And then unfortunately, even though we were doing 180 down the highway, we didn't make it in time. And I think it was kind of a blessing in disguise. I don't know if Taylor's the same, but I didn't really want to see those last few breaths. And when I had walked in to see dad, he was so peaceful. Like it, it's so weird because when you describe death, you think of this like horrible thing, but I could, I saw him and I was like, he's in a better place. I was like, why would I want to see him struggling to breathe when he's there? Just laying. The weird thing is, is that I could almost feel like everything on the inside was gone and it was just his brain and his lungs working. Yeah. And it was, I felt like it was just the body had taken over 
but what was inside had left. And it was really weird. I, I, it was almost like we were sitting there and I was like, okay, the body can give up now. Like it's time. Like the body can give up now. And it just kept fighting for like, mm. honestly, we, he was on last breaths for like 12 hours. I'd, I'd never experienced death before, but it was a really long 12 hours. And like Kaylee said, when we came back the next morning, there was the most beautiful sunrise, the sky, like it was really like so touching. The sky was like purple and pink. And yeah. I was like, oh my God, this is so beautiful because he was just finally at peace, like two years of fighting. And just to see him so quiet after that awful day before we were kind of like, okay, well, you know, now we feel at peace because we know that he's not suffering anymore. Yeah. And we were even asking the nurses questions like, this is so cruel. Do, does he have to go through this? Can we just like not really crank up the morphine and just <laughs> end this thing? Cause it was so awful. Um, but the nurses were kind of like, this is just a normal end of death process end of life death process. And we were like, okay, we'll, we'll just sit through it. And when it happens, it happens, I guess. Yeah. You hear so many stories of people on the deathbeds, whether holding on for family members to come or these different strange things. And like Kelly, you said that you were sort of glad you didn't have to see those end breaths. It's almost sounds like he was holding on, like he wanted you girls to be away and peaceful. And yeah, that, the only people who yeah. were in the room when he passed was my mum, Randall, and his other best mate, Michael. Mm. Um, Which I think was a good group because they're the ones he's known the longest. And I think that was really touching. And the weird thing is, is that Randall rang up his mum, Wendy, and was speaking to her on the phone in the hospital room. And then he rang up us. And Randall said as soon as he got off the phone to both Wendy and us, dad had passed. Yeah. And he describes it as almost like dad just needed to know or hear our voices one last time. And then he was he was done crazy <laughs> you mentioned that the the community really got around you and supported you in the, the time that your your dad was ill what support um have you guys both felt and experienced in the time since last august it's been amazing i mean immediately after the house was the best florist i'd ever seen <laughs> hundreds of hundreds of bouquets of flowers we actually ran out of table space and like the nicest letters and people sending us beautifully scented candles and and food because they just knew how hectic life was going to be after that passing. And if it wasn't for the COVID restrictions, we would have honestly had to have hired out a stadium for the funeral because uh -huh. that many people wanted to come. It was just amazing, the support. And even me having messages from parents of swimmers who live across Australia asking like, when's the funeral? We, we want to see if we can drive up, like hopefully we can get through the borders and that kind of thing. And we ended up making it work with this kind of, um, I guess, live cast where people could sit in a room at a tavern that we hired while the funeral was going on. So we were able to extend the amount of people that were watching the funeral. Um, I remember I was ready to fight the um, the service guy because before the funeral started, they obviously have to do the checklist. And I think there was like some, something like 105 and he was like, oh, like we're going to have to cut back some numbers. I was like, we're at a funeral. Can we just like forget about COVID for a quick second? He's like, look, we're just going to have to push it under the rug. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> Ready to yes, throw we hands. are. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, the support from like public as well, people that I had didn't even know, but were just able to reach me through handles like Instagram and Facebook, just sending their condolences um, was really comforting. And it's just nice to know that in a time like that, that people do have your backs and, um, they're real. They're really willing to be there to talk or be a shoulder if you need it. I think kindness goes a long way. Yeah, even if strangers really? that go go out of your way and just yeah, like you said, a bit of kindness it doesn't yeah. doesn't cost you anything, but it means mm. it mean a lot to the person you're giving exactly. it to. Yeah, absolutely. Have either of you received any um, like professional support following what, everything you've been through? Yeah, straight away. Um, Swimming Australia got notified. My mum obviously sent an email and. They offered as much support as possible, whether it was um, free psychology. Yeah, I think that's the most anyone can really do in those kind of scenarios. But then again, like I was hearing from the head coach asking how I was going, how everything was traveling. So it's just nice to know that people around us were supporting, um, even if it's just like a kind message being like, hope you're okay today. Mm. Yeah, it was really nice. Um, 
uh, I had in terms of professional services, the same thing, like, you know, if you guys need to talk to someone who might be able to help you cope with this kind of thing, um, speak to a psychologist. But personally, the best person I spoke to was a psychic medium because she was incredible and knew all of this stuff about dad that no one else outside the family would know. And this is going to sound really probably out there, but um, when I had that connection with him and he was on the other side and she was saying these things to me that I know only dad would say, I was like, oh my God, this is like the best closure I've ever had. It was so nice. And to be able to have that, I guess, like one last chat to him through her was incredible. And I paid $110 for the hour. I would have paid a grand to have that same experience again. It was amazing. And she really told me the areas that I could improve on in myself to help me with the grief process. Um, And after hearing that things had been so much better. And I think that was amazing for me. And it was worth me trying that because I was skeptical beforehand. Um, I was like, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll talk to this person. I'll talk to this person, but a psychic medium, mm, don't really know about that, but I was like open to trying anything. And I'm so glad I did. You've mentioned that with your training, it was a bit of a release, but was there ever a time that you resented training or felt like you were missing out on time with your dad? Yeah. I know that um, while there was a period of, you know, dad having his first surgery and then each kind of three months he was having those scan checkups, I would get quite anxious and I'll call Taylor up and I'm like, Taylor, I don't know what to do. Like, and I'd be bawling my eyes out 10 minutes before I'm getting into the pool and I'd just go to my coach. I'm like, I can't swim today. And those are the kind of days that I really hated myself. I was like, how am I not strong enough to get in the pool and swim? Whether my dad's sitting in a hospital bed kind of thing, or, you know, he doesn't know his end date, whether I've got a whole life to live. Yeah. So they're the days that I really struggled. Mm. Yeah, it was hard to find the balance between, I guess, our love for swimming and our love for our dad. And my mum would personally, my mum would say things to me like, your dad would want you to swim and do the best that you can and really go out there and enjoy life regardless of what's going on. So I think, um, you know, we did have that good balance of going to training when we felt like we could. And then also spending a lot of time with dad and swimming for me was such a great distraction because I've been training for like 15 years, if not more of my life now at that high level. And I walk into a pool area and I'm immediately like, okay, I'm here to train. I'm here to do a job. Let's get in, let's smash it. And so for me, every time I would dive in, my strength was getting in there and having a rip and having a really good session. So um, for me, swimming was such a great distraction from the reality. Um. Were there any conversations that you you had with your dad during the time towards the end or did he have any sayings during that time that have stayed with you and motivate you? Um, I know it's kind of like a running joke in the family, but his dad always used to say to him, have a go, Sholto. And I think dad that was kind of like, have a go, Sholto. In our very <laughs> Irish accent. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so that was kind of just like a running joke in the family, but I really took that to heart. But I remember – probably two days before dad passed, I remember we were able to say, dad, if you can hear me and you know who I am, squeeze my hand. And I went in to go and do that. And he was no longer squeezing my hand anymore. And I kind of turned to my grandma, Wendy. Um, yeah. And I was like, Wendy, she hates I- being called grandma. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Wendy, I'm so terrified. And she's like, we all are sweetie, but have a go. And I just like, that was the moment that I was like, this isn't good anymore. <laughs> but having her say that I was like, it's a reminder that life is too short to kind of get hung up and, you know, as sucky as it is to having our father pass away, it's almost a huge speed bump in the road, but it's given us the extra motivation to live our lives to the fullest. Mm. And that's what he always did anyway. Like he was always around mates, music blaring, camping, boating, fishing, drinking beer. So he was always like out there experiencing life and really having fun and, that to me, like after his, after he passed, I was like, shit, like life is way too short to be hung up on stuff that doesn't even really matter. Like you just got to get out there and experience it as best you can and and make the most of life while you have it. You take some comfort in the fact, knowing that as well, that he did live a full life and that he, although his life was cut short, that the years that he did have, he really made the most of them. 
Literally, it was hard for me to put a funeral video together for dad. Oh, the funeral director was like, look, people can get bored at funerals. So you're <laughs> going to want to make this video about four minutes. And I was like, okay, that's a song length. Like, let's see what I can get. And I've gone back through the video cameras and I'm like, shit, we've done so much stuff. How can I possibly fit this into four minutes? It ended up being closer to 12. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> but um, I put it up on YouTube so that our family, friends and stuff can still watch it whenever. And even like last week, I had people messaging me being like, oh, I watched your dad's video the other day. It's so good. I can't stop. Like, I'm so glad that you made that. But looking through that video, I'm like, crap, we really had fit a lot into the time that he was alive, like as a family and even him as a youngster as well. Like he really did live a full life. Yeah. What you said, he was so supportive of his sporting endeavors. And Taylor, for you, for the family seeing Kaylee touch the wall and win that gold medal in Tokyo, what did that, that mean for the family? That was like amazing. And I tell people all the time about, I use Kaylee through dad passing away and then going on to swim so amazingly at the Olympics is like the pinnacle of resilience. Like you can't knock her down (laughs) kind of thing. (laughs) Like if someone can go through losing a parent and then 12 months later come out and win three Olympic gold medals and an Olympic bronze, it's like, holy shit. Like you can do anything if you put your mind to it. So um, I think that that's like a really great example of just, pure determination and and grit you know she's just such an amazing athlete and immediately after the race the camera people are like in our faces and I just couldn't get words out (laughs) like for the first time ever I'm usually like oh yeah good job that was an amazing swim I was just like "Ah, ah." (laughs) like there was just nothing I was just like pure joy and just like hell yes she's done it kind of thing you know like no always knew she could do it but she got up there and she did it. And it was just like, oh my God, here we are. Like she's done it for dad. She's done it for herself. Like it was just the most amazing feeling. I can't even imagine how Kaylee felt. Like it was <laughs> I know, just crazy. I know it's so cringe to say, but I kind of did like this ritual thing, like 10 minutes before I get in for my race warm up, I'd sit on the side of the pool and I kind of just like said my thank yous. Um, I've never actually shared this out loud, but yeah, I'd sit there and say my thank yous. And that was kind of my way of, bringing him into the race. So I knew when I was standing behind the blocks, it wasn't just me. So I think my reaction said everything afterwards. And it was just such a relief because it was our dad's biggest dream to see both of us represent the pinnacle. So we've both done that. And I think we've done more than he would have ever imagined we could have. I think so. I remember, I actually have a very vivid memory of dad saying to me in Rio, um, like after the swimming was done, we were kind of walking out of the stadium together before we had to split off our separate ways. And he was like, well, next time we'll have Kaylee here. <laughs> and I remember thinking like, hell yeah, that's going to be so sick. Like two <laughs> sisters going to the Olympics, which would be amazing. Yeah. Um, so he had faith. And then to see her come out and do that is just like, you know, it's the cherry on top of this amazing journey of everything we'd been through. And you touched on post uh, swim interviews. What do you think he would have said about, <laughs> about, about that interview, oh. Kaylee? Oh, I think he would have been giving me a bit of a fist pump, to be honest. Yeah. Like I said, he w- did have a bit of a wild side. So I think, oh, honestly, it was probably him coming out of me, to be yeah. honest, I'm saying that. But yeah, mum mom was like, where did you learn that from? I was like, well, you've got to learn it from something. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, don't act innocent now. Literally, dad, he, he dropped F-bombs all the time around the place, just casually. So it was just so like beautiful and raw and organic to see Kaylee kind of forget that she was on TV for a minute there and then look down and see us and be able to share that excitement with us, knowing that dad was there all along as well. It was just so natural. And to this day, no one's said anything bad about it. So I think Australia's got her support in that. So so (laughs) often sports people get so uh, like rigid and just the same answers all the time. So see a bit of like personality and humanity coming out. Well, I I honestly forgot that I was on live television because they had like these little screens that you could look down at and see the reactions from your family. And of course, like you get out of the pool, you're all hyped, the adrenaline's running through your body and they're asking me these questions and I look down for a quick second. I'm like, oh, there's mum, there's Taylor, there's all my friends. I was like, this is sick. (laughs) And then they were just like, oh, like, how do you feel? I can't even remember what they had asked. And I was just like, yes, I swore I'm not going to do it again. I sworn to myself I'm not going to do it. It was so funny. And we had like Gina Reinhardt in the room as well and presidents and stuff and they were all laughing and I'm like, all right, 
Okay, if these serious people are laughing, <laughs> I think that's amazing, then we're all good. <laughs> yeah, and I remember, like, that was the on-deck media, and then you had to go underneath the grandstand, and there was probably, like, another 200 metres worth of media, and I remember seeing our manager, and I was like, okay, don't be mad, but I've just sworn on live television, and she was like, look, I expect nothing less from you. <laughs> and I was like, okay, okay, we're good. Feel better, yeah. 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 You should have seen the crew, like, bracing after her second gold medal. They were like, all right, we've got the beeper, like, ready to beep <laughs> her out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. I think it's a great representation of Australia. I think hopefully we're known as the bloody larrikins on the world stage. So I think you've done us all proud. Yeah, oh, thank you. You definitely have. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> and you're, what's it? Um, Ariane Titmus's coach as well going nuts. Dean, Boxel, Dean yeah. yeah, he was going wild up in the grandstand. It's literally like I've seen so many videos of people saying that the Olympics is wrapped up by those two just being like crazy Australians. Yeah. It was awesome. Sums us up pretty well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. Kaylee, tell us about the tattoo that you've had um, put on your foot. Yeah, so Taylor and actually Taylor and I actually went in to get a tattoo together. Um, they're not matching. Um, Taylor says I've got you and it's on the back of her arm and I've got mine on my foot that says I'll always be with you and it's actually from a country song and it kind of just like the song itself is really beautiful so I thought you know I get into his writing and it's just a beautiful reminder that he's always going to be there with me um, every step that I take hence why it's on the foot Awesome, and you, man. you like looking at it before you do your backstroke start, don't you? Yeah, yeah. it's oh, it's kind yeah. of a weird yeah. position because my when my feet are up it says be with you so that's kind of cool as well. That is cool. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a small one on the back of my arm, which says I've got you and it's by a band called Camp Cope. Um, it's an all female band and it's a rock group and my dad loved rock music. So I was like, all right, box one ticked. That's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> but the song is actually about um, the band singer's dad passing away from cancer and the lyrics when I heard the song the first time I was like holy shit this is relatable I was like I couldn't believe it and I actually took sections of that song out for a poem that I read at dad's funeral and I just think the whole meaning behind I've got you it's like you know now he's always going to be there he's always got our backs and um it's in his handwriting too which is something I'll have on my body forever um, which is really special. And he was more than happy to write out I've Got You and for me to go get it tattooed, which was beautiful. Yeah, it's cool. Love it. Girls, do you have any advice for anyone that might be going through a similar situation? I know it's probably hard to, to give advice, but any advice you could give for someone experiencing something similar? I guess there is no wrong and right. I mean, there were so many people that's come up to me and had said that, and it really is true. Um, I guess you've just got to really focus on what you think is going to be best for your mental state um, whilst also being there for whoever may be sick, whether it's a friend or a family member. Um, just do your absolute best to support. Mm. Yeah, I think um, doing your best to also be a little bit selfless and care for the people around you is important as well. Um, as, as, as much as people are going to try and care for you, there's going to be your family members and friends that are going to need some inner family circle support as well. So giving and taking and just, I guess, being the best person you can be. Like there was times where there was high tensions at home and we'd kind of have to just remind each other to just simmer down a little bit and enjoy the time that we have. Um, and if there is anybody listening who is going through this journey of someone who's got a terminal diagnosis, just, try to remember the small things every day and make every day count um, and just be the best version of yourself that you can, you know, push all those small arguments and petty things aside and just live for what's real. Great advice. Yeah, good, Thank good, you. good advice. Do you each have a favourite memory of Shelter that stands out to you? Oh, so many. <laughs> <laughs> that is such a hard question. So, oh, gosh. I, I don't know how I could put it down to one. What would you say? Um, oh, I don't know. I think it's just like the little things, like the little kind of spur of the moments where it's like, oh, dad, can we go to the creek? And, you know, you would go to the creek and you'll try to go off the rope swing or something like that and belly flop or, you know, just little things like that. Just like for me, it was like him just being such an idiot, like lying on the couch and letting the dog like lick yogurt off his face and stuff. Like, <laughs> <laughs> disgusting, yeah. <laughs> just like such random little memories. Um, but I just loved how throughout his entire life um, he would do absolutely anything for 
my mom, Kaylee and myself, like we moved houses that many times and the amount of decks, the amount of patios, the amount of bloody pool water slides that my dad and cubby houses that he had to build was amazing. Like he would put his own priorities and what he wanted to do on weekends aside to, to make us all happy. Like I'm sure in those times he would have loved to have taken the boat out and gone fishing, but he was too busy building the back deck of our new house. So I just, um, my, my wrap up memory of my dad is just someone who was so selfless and just incredible and so kind. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. Thanks girls. Thanks for coming in and having a chat. That was awesome. Different sort of perspective. We haven't really had yet of that. Yeah. Terminal cancer. So although a lot of negatives, obviously it was very hard for you guys, but the way you dealt with it, obviously coming together as a family and I think you yeah, did about as well as you could in that situation. I think it's a, both such good portrayals of resilience, Kaylee, especially you to come out and uh, achieve what you did at the Olympics of less than a year after uh, losing your dad is such an amazing feat and I personally feel like uh, after hearing the stories that you've shared with us I feel like I've, I knew Sh- Sholto so <laughs> yeah. thank you very much awesome. well thank you for having us on it's definitely the first time I've kind of opened up with Taylor by my side so yeah, a bit more comforting <laughs> yeah. yeah so yeah. thank you yeah no this is the first time I've been able to come out and talk about what happened publicly and the kind of things that we've been through as a family, what it feels like. So thank you for giving this, giving this opportunity to us. And um, I'm a really big fan of what you do. I think this whole podcast idea is amazing and so inspiring. Like I would listen to this any day over any regular sports podcast. So thank you so much. No, thank you. Yeah. We're trying to sort of spread a positive message. So yeah. Yeah. to know what's having an impact on people is great. So thank yeah, you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, that was awesome to have Taylor and Kaylee on, two sisters that regardless of what they've been through, they're still two sisters to make the Olympics and for Kaylee to win three gold, they've um, they've done amazing. And to to think about what they've been through while all, while achieving all that, um, yeah, no, it was awesome to get them on. So as always, though, we, we look forward now onto our next guest and that is Zoe Hode. A successful bikini model and brand ambassador, Zoe has battled an eating disorder that saw her weigh just 39 kilos at one stage and spend time in an eating disorder clinic. We'll be chatting with her about what she went through to get to that weight, the impact she saw her condition have on those around her, and how she's been able to come out the other side. So looking forward to having Zoe on to have a chat. And guys, something close to my heart, uh, the uh, Perry Cross Foundation is currently fundraising to find a cure for spinal cord injuries. So if you can spare any money out there and you'd like to donate to an amazing cause, they're getting very close and the really only thing holding them back from from finding a, a cure for this is money. So if you can donate, please head to the Perry Cross Foundation page on Instagram and you'll find links there to donate or just Google Perry Cross Foundation and um, any money you can spare would be be amazing. As always, guys, Beyond Blue have given us the green light to offer their support. Another difficult podcast, so if it brings up any negative emotions and you feel like you need the support, please contact Beyond Blue on 1300 224 636 or go online to beyondblue.org.au and navigate their website to the online chat. Don't forget to check in on each other and remember, it ain't weak to speak. Such an important message and definitely, definitely follow that message, guys. And check out our social media pages as well. The, um, the unaffected underscore podcast is our Instagram and you'll find links there to all our other social medias, to our um, YouTube, TikTok, Facebook, or you can look up our Facebook page, The Unaffected Podcast. Um, we also have an email address you can reach us on, theunaffectedpod at gmail.com. So reach out on any of them if you have any questions for us, any guests you think we should get on, and also just help uh, share our share our stuff and help us spread our spread our message would be amazing. And so, and on that note, we'll end it. So thanks for listening, and hope you come back.